The British weather is a constant topic of conversation, often unpredictable. It's now having an even bigger effect on our lives. Dangerous floods threaten our homes. Forest fires devastate our countryside and savage storms ravage our coastlines. Today, we find out what happens when Britain gets hit by freak weather. We see the stories of people's lives who've been turned upside down by the totally unexpected. And we show you how to protect yourself, your home and your family from disaster. Welcome to Living Dangerously. We've all seen the terrible headlines of hurricanes, flooding and storm damage. But what's it really like when extreme weather wrecks your life? Well, today we hear two more incredible stories of catastrophe and survival. Coming up on Living Dangerously. Devastating floods in the Cornish village of Boscastle leave one woman facing her worst nightmare. Didn't know where my husband or son were. Didn't know whether anyone might lose their life, in fact, because it was that scary. And a South London family house is literally swallowed up by the earth. I just said, I think our house is falling down. With home video, actual footage and reconstruction, we show what happened during these real-life weather events. This quaint and tranquil spot on the North Cornish coast is Boscastle, an unspoilt village that boasts a pristine medieval harbour and a pretty river. It was these picture postcard qualities that attracted the Upton family from Doncaster who came to visit in August 2004. We loved it. Um, we felt it was typically Cornish, it was quite quaint. It was all very pleasant. My dad had always fancied going down into Boscastle uh, just, just to have a look around. It's one place we'd never been. The weather had been promising. Um, I only had flip-flops on and shorts and uh, an open shirt and so we, th we thought we were in for a good warm day. Barbara Upton, her husband Tony and son John had planned a relaxing day exploring the coastal village. But one of the worst flash floods this country has ever seen was about to hit this seaside village, causing hundreds to fear for their lives and leaving homes, cars and businesses destroyed. The weather forecast for that day was heavy, sometimes torrential rain. But the morning was bright and the Uptons made the most of it. It was gloriously warm and sunny, so we had a walk around the harbour and on the cliff. And when it got a bit black and cloudy, we went for something to eat in the cafe, um, at which point it started to rain. It was almost torrential rain. The heavens just, just opened, no warning at all. And um, everyone was, you know, scurrying about outside, you know, trying to find somewhere dry to, you know, to jump into. Just thought it'd be a quick shower, and uh, and that'd be it. The rain fell steadily, but even in August, it wasn't particularly unusual to experience a rainy day by the Cornish seaside. So a couple of hours later, Mum and Dad decided to brave the elements and continue with their plans. When Tony and I decided to go and have a look at the harbour, John decided he didn't want to get wet anymore and he was going to stay in the car and listen to his music and just relax and chill out. Being 14, 15, I wasn't really that bothered about walking around a small town, so I'd just go back to the car, put my headphones in and just relax, shut my eyes, you know, and, uh, and I thought, you know, they'll be back in 20, you know, 20, 25 minutes. John was now half a mile away from his parents at the top of the village. Little did he know that his decision to separate from them would have such serious implications. Back down in the village, all eyes were on the River Valency, which flows through Boscastle. After well over two hours of intense rainfall, the amount of water flowing into the river increased dramatically causing the river to flow fuller and faster than before. It seemed to be welling up all the time, and as soon as it started overflowing and covering the banks, we made our way up to the bridge to, um, to have a look and, and watch it coming down at the side of the buildings and the hotel that was there. 
Locals and holidaymakers alike gathered to witness the spectacle. Water levels were rising and rain streaming down the steep sides of the surrounding valley only swelled the river further. But as Tony and Barbara arrived at the bridge, fascination was about to turn to alarm. By this time, it was actually very cold and wet. I had a small umbrella with me, which wasn't doing a great deal, but I kept it up out of habit, I think. Um, and when I turned, I saw the water rushing down the village. By now, Boscastle had suffered three hours of continuous rainfall, and it was too much for this straining river. Its banks burst and millions of gallons of water gushed through the village centre. With water overflowing onto the streets, the Uptons knew the situation had rapidly worsened. Immediately, they became concerned for their son, who was back in the car park right next to the river. And my first thought was for John. Um, and so Tony said, I was to stay there, he would go and make sure John was all right in the car, in the car park. So that's what happened. By that time, the water was up to Tony's calves. Meanwhile, back in the car, John was listening to his music, unaware the car park was becoming flooded. So I was a bit hungry, so I'd go into the, into the boot of the car, and uh, I stepped out of the car and I was um, knee deep in water, which was quite a shock. And, um, and I realised, obviously, my parents weren't there, so I thought, you know, well, what's going on? Because at this point, people were just panicking, grabbing all the stuff, trying to run, trying to get the cars out of the car park. And um, being 14, I didn't really know what to do. You know, I was uh, a bit of a loss. You don't really expect that kind of thing to happen on holiday. And I thought, well, try and get to the highest place possible. I couldn't get out of the car park. No way would I have been able to walk through it. So the best bet was just to get on top of the car. It was the driest place I could find at that, at that point. So I grabbed my bag with all my belongings in it and the car keys and uh, I sat in the car and just hoped and prayed that, that everything was going to be all right. Events now moved incredibly swiftly. Many of the main roads into town became impassable. Some of the village's stone walls began to collapse. And as the cars began to float in the flooded car park, coast guards and emergency services received their first 999 calls from the public. Deputy Chief Fire Officer Ted Simpson was alerted and made his way to the stricken village. The weather in Truro was, uh, was bright sunshine, nice conditions, um, but as I made my way to the north coast, I noticed that the, the sky started to darken, and as I reached the Boscastle area, it was just a mass of black clouds with lightning threading through the clouds. The rain was just absolutely torrential. In fact, I've never seen rain like it. Although all coastal towns are prone to high rainfall, thanks to the sea air's high moisture content, this was a freakish downpour. But three factors made the problem worse. First, the hills around the village, which were forcing the air to rise and release more rain. Second, conflicting wind currents that kept this bad weather stationary. And third, Boscastle's old drainage system was blocked by rocks washed down from the hills, causing the water to back up. With rescue crews speeding to the village, the flash flooding continued to wreak havoc. Raging torrents of water from the intense rain and swollen river were pouring through the streets. As roads were swept away, fire and ambulance crews were confronted with huge amounts of debris swept along by the floods. Uh, the scale of this incident more or less covered Boscastle as a village. Um, there are a significant number of houses that were flooded um, and there were a lot of houses that were in danger of collapse. Meanwhile, Barbara was still waiting anxiously by the bridge. Tony didn't materialise at all, by which time the water I was standing in was ankle deep. Um, and I began to see things floating down the street. At that point, Tony was wading through the submerged roads in search of son John, who was still in the car park, perched on the top of the car, fearing for his life. 
And at that point, um, cars were just rolling down the car park. I mean, there was one car that was on its side. Water had taken it, and it was travelling down the river. John's car was on slightly higher ground than other vehicles, and so hadn't budged yet. But as the water's speed and depth increased, so did his chances of being swept away. I realised that I really wasn't in a very good predicament at all. I hoped something was going to happen as quick as possible, you know, because um, at any point I could have been, I could have been washed down with the other cars. At any point, it could have just gone. Coming up on Living Dangerously, in the midst of one of Britain's worst ever natural disasters, will a mother's worst nightmare become a reality? Am I going to see my son at 14 be washed away in my vehicle? On the outskirts of South London lies the town of Bromley in the leafy county of Kent. Just a 20-minute commute into central London, it's a popular suburb filled with pristine family homes. But beneath this suburban idyll lurks a clear and present danger. Over hundreds of years, that most ordinary of British weather conditions, the rain, is dramatically affecting what goes on far below the surface of the ground. Across Britain, millions of houses have been built on layers of clay, or, like in Bromley, on chalk. But years and years of ordinary rain have made these layers unstable and put some homes at a real risk from subsidence. Eve Shepherd was oblivious to the possible dangers of the underlying chalk when she decided to make Bromley her home. I've lived in the, in the South London all my life, which is 58 years. We had a three bedroom and this was a nice quiet area and our children had left home, so this suited us better. I like it to look nice. New bathroom, new kitchen. Like any property when you move in, you, you want it how you want to do it. In June 2003, Eve and her husband Terry found their dream home, a three-bedroom semi with a garage in Bromley. But little did they know that as a result of years of unrelenting British rain, on April the 11th, 2006, this perfect pad would literally fall to pieces around them. And I'm catching up with Eve to find out what happened. Hi, Eve, welcome. Nadia. Oh, thank, thank you. you for having me. You're welcome. Good. So, Eve, take me back to that morning. Phew, um, about ten past four in the morning we heard a crackling sound. Didn't think any more of it. Went back to bed. Two or three minutes later, we heard an almighty noise. So my husband got up and put the lights on, and as he did that, the plaster above the door and the windows started to crack. And what did you think at that moment? Um, I didn't think anything. I think Terry knew, had an idea something was, was, wasn't quite right but didn't want to alarm me too much. As we was coming down the stairs, the wall started to crack as well and split open. I phoned 999. Who had you phoned when you phoned 999? You phoned 999 mm. and they say to you, what service? And I went, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I mean, I bet that's what I was just thinking. I wouldn't know what service to ask for. Um, I just said, I think our house is falling down. The operator at the other end just said, get out as soon as possible. You just think it's a bad dream. We've gone along to our neighbours and awoken them because we didn't know what was happening and they thought I'd had one too many to drink. 23 metres under their house is a layer of chalk, which is a soft, powdery limestone that can slowly dissolve from hundreds, if not thousands, of years of acid rainwater. Cavities, called swallow holes, can form underground and open up to suck in everything lying on top of it. Unbeknown to the shepherds, their house was sitting directly on one of these holes and was being held up by little more than a huge strip of sand. Soon after Eve and Terry were first woken by strange noises, 
the emergency services turned up. The fire brigade arrived about half past four. Um, they made us leave the pavement and go into the road because they deemed they didn't know what was happening. The firefighters kept everyone out on the road until they could call out a building surveyor from the local council to assess the situation. The borough surveyor came about seven. He entered the property with Terry and the chief fire officer. They've gone up the stairs and came out and said, you've got five minutes to pick up what you can. What did you feel in that moment? There's Just nothing. the shock. There's nothing you, you can do, but, I mean, we actually knew once he said that, that the house was going to come down. There's, there's that question that sometimes people play with each other, isn't it? If, you're, if your house is on fire, what would be the things that you would save, you know? And you were really put in that position. You're, you're, you know, you're going to lose your home, go in five minutes. What on earth did you all get? Louise, my youngest daughter, went in. She picked up my late mum's ashes, underwear, clothes, a little bit of jewellery, and stuff that the girls had done when they were smaller. Jewelry you, you can replace, but my mum's ashes can't replace those, can you? If they if they went. And and, and is that all that you managed to get from a lifetime's worth of possession? That's hard. The British acidic rainfall had worn away the chalk far down under the shepherd's home. It couldn't hold up anymore and the house was beginning to fall into a huge swallow hole. These underground cavities can go unnoticed for years until a trigger opens them up. The authorities could never tell the shepherds exactly what caused the collapse. The ground was so precariously balanced on top of the giant hole beneath that heavy rain, flash floods, drought or even a train rushing past could have triggered this type of subsidence. So once you'd got all the stuff that you could out of the house, what happened next? Nothing, really. Um, a lot of noise, a lot of rumbling. So it's just a case of waiting. Every time there was a rumble, something happened. And then you'd see a crack appear where the bricks had been dislodged. Um, you'd look again, and the drain pipe has moved. Another rumble. A window is all lopsided. And this went on f for a couple of hours. By now, it was five and a half hours since Eve and Terry were rudely awakened by strange noises and the inevitable was about to happen. A neighbour took me in, a um, cup of coffee and that, and because they knew something was going to happen because how the house was falling, about 20 past, 25 past nine, and then you heard an almighty bang. Oh. And that is when my neighbour said, open the door, she must have done. The front of the house is gone. Like a house made of matchsticks, Eve and Terry's home began to fall apart. The front facade collapsed and their living room and bedrooms were exposed. With the debris and their personal possessions sucked into the hole that had opened up in the ground. By now, Eve plucked up the courage to take a look at what was going on. That's when I came out and saw the whole front and it carried on rumbling. And every time I rumble, the hole seemed to appear, get bigger and bigger. There was no hope for the shepherd's house. Together with their neighbours, they watched helplessly as it sunk into the ground before their very eyes. 
There was a loud crack and the corner of the house just collapsed completely and you could see straight inside the house, which was really quite scary at the time. It was more or less the whole of the lounge because the television had gone into it and an armchair had gone into it. So it was literally that the hole was devouring your house? Swallowing the house up. When it actually fell, you could see all through the ground floor and half of the top floor. You could see our bed hanging out in our bedroom and in the small bedroom, there was a single bed hanging out and everything was just all tilted to one side. What was that like to watch that? Strange. As I said before, you, you can't stop it. It's just something that happened and you've got to wait until it stops. Coming up on Living Dangerously, after seeing their home being sucked into the earth, the shepherds have to witness the rest of it being destroyed completely. And could the British weather affect the house where you live? We tell you what you need to know. In August 2004, one of the worst flash floods in recent British history devastated the Cornish village of Boscastle. Homes, roads and businesses were destroyed and hundreds of lives put at risk. Phone lines went down and power cut out. It was one of the worst disasters Fire Brigade Deputy Chief Ted Simpson had ever encountered. I got a briefing from uh, the incident commander. He told me the situation, told me how bad it was, the scale of the operation. There were houses collapsing around, around firefighters and residents. There were about six helicopters in the air plucking people off roofs. The rescue operation was in full swing, but the Upton family had become separated. Barbara's son John was stranded on the top of the family car in a flooded car park, and her husband Tony was on his way to find him. As Barbara waited anxiously for them to return, she had no idea whether they were even still alive. None of us knew how this was going to end. We didn't know where we were going to go. I didn't know what I personally um, was going to do. I didn't know where my husband or son were. Um, didn't know whether anyone might lose their life, in fact, because it was that scary. Dad Tony had managed to fight his way through the floods to his parked car, where he was reunited with his son John. They'd been wading through the water onto higher ground. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Mum Barbara was about to witness the most terrifying scenes that would leave her fearing even more for her family. And then vehicles began to rush past. She was fraught with worry that the family car could be swept down the river with her son John trapped inside it. The powers of nature had turned on this tiny village. By now, the flash flooding in Boscastle was wreaking havoc throughout the town. Over 100 cars were swept away and 32 ended up in the open sea. It was a very anxious time. Um, am I going to see? my son at 14 be washed away in my vehicle. I think that's one of the reasons why I didn't move. I was transfixed to the spot because I felt I needed to know one way or the other what had happened to my own son. But things had suddenly taken a turn for the worse for John and Tony in the waterlogged car park. Due to the rising floodwaters, father and son had become separated again and John had to take refuge on another car roof while Tony, on safe ground, was left powerless to help. In the situation where, where all, the, all the water was coming down, you, you can't do anything, you can't fight it. Once you've got something which is getting on about knee height, you don't have, a, uh, you don't have much of a chance um, with water travelling at that speed. But luckily, help was at hand. Emergency vehicles and rescue helicopters raced to the scene. In the nick of time, the fire brigade fought their way through the floods and joined forces with local bystanders to get to John. And what they did was um, they made a human chain. There must have been 14 or 15 of them. And um, they managed to reach the car 
and um, they grabbed me and my bag and they actually passed me along each other until I was um, on solid, dry ground. With Tony and John now safe, their thoughts turned to Barbara. The one thing that that, that really that really hit me was, uh, where's my mum? You know, your mum's always there for you and, and uh, she wasn't, I didn't know where she was. It was three hours since the river burst its banks and the storms were finally showing signs of receding as the evening began. John and Tony were still fretting about Barbara's well-being, but back in the centre of the village, Barbara was benefiting from the kindness of some fellow holidaymakers, who offered her a bed in their rented accommodation outside the reach of the flood. The lady Patsy I'd been talking to suggested that I go back with them. There was nothing we could do there. Um, everyone was, was tired and exhausted in a state of shock. Um, and I think I just followed. Um, and they took me in for the night, um, made sure I'd got a change of clothing and, and that sort of thing. As police and fire brigades carried on working to bring any casualties to safety, makeshift shelters for the survivors sprung up around the town. And it was basically a, the case of Stay in there and just waiting for any word of, uh, you know, if, if anybody had heard where my mum was. Uh, that was the worst part, was the waiting. Uh, the waiting really gets to you, you know. Taking refuge in a local leisure centre, John and Tony faced a long night, frantic with worry that Barbara may have been swept away and killed in the flood. And it was comforting to be around other people who had been in the same situation because we could comfort each other, tell each other stories, you know, and, just, you know, just relax in the fact that you're not on your own, you know, that there are other people going through the same thing as you. And that did give you strength when you were waiting, you know. When I tried to find out what was going on, it proved to be impossible for quite a long time. Uh, there were no landlines available. There was no network for mobile phones. So th th there was a sense of time stopping, really. Um, because there was no one I could talk to about what was going on. Couldn't find out where the people on the other side of the village had gone or been taken. So it was just waiting and waiting for time to pass till we could find out something. With hundreds homeless, but thankfully safe and dry, the potential scale of the disaster was still hitting home for the emergency services. As nightfall approached, I still had not one victim of this incident but I was worried that there were many victims left trapped in buildings or were, in, were, were trapped in the debris. So overnight, I ordered on around about 200 body bags because I feared the worst. As nightfall fell, we decided to suspend operations because it was just too hazardous. There wasn't a lot of sleep, uh, I have to say. I, I recall sitting up in bed, thinking, uh, praying, um, for my family. It was very, very nerve-wracking. Um, I hardly got any sleep at all. You know, I, I, I just couldn't rest, because obviously it was all, all playing in my mind. I'd shut my eyes, and you'd hear the roaring of the water, you know, um, and you'd hear, you'd hear the helicopters going over, you know, trying to look for people and stuff. Coming up on Living Dangerously, after being separated by appalling flash flooding, the Upton family are finally reunited. But can they lay to rest the ghost of the Boscastle flood? It's a bit overwhelming, to say the least. Um... Back in Bromley, South London, and the wet British climate has had a devastating effect on the earth beneath Eve and Tony Shepherd's house. It's been literally consumed by a massive swallow hole. This subsidence was caused by years of acid rainfall, weakening chalk rock that lay beneath the house. And one cataclysmic morning in April 2006, the rock gave way, opening up a gaping cavity that swallowed everything on top of it. You could see all through the ground floor and half of the top floor. You could see our bed hanging out and everything was just all tilted to one side. But it wasn't just Eve and Terry's property that the British weather was ultimately responsible for wrecking. Ten days after Eve and Terry's house started to collapse, 
their home and three neighbouring houses were demolished, as all were deemed unsafe. This was their house. Tests were done on the ground and the local authority decided to make it safe. They filled in the cavity to make it solid and laid down a concrete platform to secure house foundations. This enabled the four semi-detached properties to be rebuilt on exactly the same spot. But it wasn't until January 2008, 17 months after they lost their house, that Eve and Terry were able to move into their brand new home a replica of what they'd loved before. But there are still reminders of what seemingly innocent British rainfall caused that fateful day. OK, so, Eve, where did you first see the hole? The hole appeared when the front of the house dropped down. And then, with every rumbling, it's just got bigger and bigger. Really? And how far over did it spread? I suppose... Say where you are there. So this, this much? The hole. Wow. How deep was the hole? They said from what they could see, they reckoned about 20 foot it had stopped. <gasps> Goodness me. But, I mean, ha everything was all just piled on top of it, so it could have been deeper. We, we don't know. I mean, standing here, you wouldn't have an inkling that that kind of carnage went on, though I have to say, it's just... Slightly uneven, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I don't know if I feel a little bit nervous. I might stand over here. <laughs> Blame the builders. What happened to Eve and Terry's house is thankfully very unusual. But I'm meeting geologist Dr Tony Cooper to find out just how concerned we should all be. Tony, I've just come from Eve's house and it is phenomenal what has happened there. Is it common? Common from the point of view that we, we get one or two a year in the whole country right. that, that affect a property. It's, it's that common. So for people that are watching now, Tony, I mean, should they be frightened? It does occur. Uh, it's not uh, going to happen to everybody. Mm. You don't look around and see all the houses falling down. If you live on chalk or any of these soluble rocks, then it's wise to take precautions. <clears throat> and if you get something like a, a burst water pipe or a leaking drain, to get it fixed fairly quickly. Right. Because you may or may not have a hole underneath your house, and uh, adding water and things like that to the ground can trigger off a collapse. So, you know, to be wise, you should make sure that you don't lose water into the ground. If you've had a full survey done on your house, would, would all this sort of stuff come up? Well, the house buyers' packs that get done these days do include searches of the, the geological conditions, and that will say whether you've got soluble rocks under your house and to what degree the geologists have assessed that to be a, a problem. It's reassuring to know that you would be extremely unlucky to encounter this kind of devastating subsidence especially any as severe as these examples from around the UK. Incredibly, this 10-metre-wide crater opened up overnight. But what about the more familiar hairline cracks we see in our properties, caused either by soluble rocks or the rain-related shrinking and swelling of clay? If you think you've got subsidence, you need to check your insurance policy and then look to notify your insurers or, if you're still unsure, speak to a local structural engineer and get his advice. You need to remember that all buildings move and that small cracks are to be expected. Please, I don't want you to get worried about those fine cracks that appear in the summer and have gone by the end of the winter. They are to be expected in all houses. It's been three years since Eve and Terry saw their South London semi literally swallowed up by the earth. Insured, they moved into rented accommodation, while their house was rebuilt on the same spot. 
Now, happily settled in their new home, Eve's giving me a guided tour. Eve, everything is absolutely pristine. It's gorgeous now, isn't it? And can we have a look through? Yeah, sure, go through. Oh, God, I love looking at kitchens. Oh, oh, isn't it lovely? It's so light and airy. Is this your dream kitchen now? Yes, it is. Well, it's absolutely lovely. Oh, and th this is your bedroom? Yes, that's our bedroom. All pristine again. It's comfortable, nice and comfortable. And this is what it should be. It was good to see this plucky lady back in a home she could be proud of after the nightmare she'd been through. It shouldn't happen, but it did. There was nothing we could do to stop it. And our main concern was nobody got hurt. Everything chaos can be rebuilt. Who would have thought that even seemingly innocent rain could cause such havoc? You can never predict where the weather will strike next. In one of the worst British natural disasters in recent times, a freak flash flood hit the Cornish village Boscastle in August 2004, leaving complete devastation in its wake and separating Barbara Upton from her husband and son. After a difficult night with fellow holidaymakers Mike and Patsy, Barbara still had no idea whether her family was still alive. Luckily, the next morning brought heartening news. Many people had been taken to the local sports centre uh, and they stayed there overnight. Um, and eventually, someone told us that John and Tony were there. It was quite a while before we could actually get out of the village. No one was being allowed in or out. So about lunchtime, um, we were able to leave and Michael and Patsy took me in their car to the sports centre. It was about 24 hours um, before we actually found out where she was and then it was another seven or eight hours before, um, before she got brought to us. And that was the worst part, knowing that she was all right, but just waiting for it to come, you know. And when we arrived, um, there were several people milling about outside and we pulled up and I just got out of the car. Somebody must have shouted, John and Tony. They came rushing out and there were hugs all round. I've never been so happy in my life, you know. I mean, I've always been a bit of a mummy's boy, I must admit. Um, but seeing my mum just running up and giving her a big hug was just the best thing ever. Oh, it's a good feeling. Yeah, it's a good feeling. To be back together again. Hmm. When I saw Tony and uh, John again, the, the first feeling was a sense of immense relief. You know, thank God, they're all right, we're, we're all together. Also, uh, still a sense of shock um, that somehow this, this lovely little village had been absolutely devastated. And I think all we wanted to do was go back to our little cottage and just be quiet and reflect, really, and be thankful that we were all together again. That day, Boscastle woke up to utter devastation after being beaten into submission by some of the worst floods ever seen in Britain in living memory. 100 homes were affected, with four being washed away altogether by over 400 million gallons of water rampaging through the village. But despite all the damaged property and vehicles, miraculously, no one was seriously injured, and the majority of missing people were reunited with their families the next day. However, the people of Boscastle had a long way to go to rebuild their lives. Thankfully, Boscastle has only a one in 400 chance of such a flood happening again. But with millions of us living in flood risk areas, how can we protect our homes and families? If your house is at flood risk, you can register to receive a flood warning if there's a flood warning service for that location. A really good idea is to prepare a flood plan, so have things in place for you, for you and your family to do if you receive a flood warning or if you think your house is going to flood and it might be to, to move your belongings out of harm's way to higher ground get your medication ready, all the things that you think if your house is going to flood that you need to have quickly. Today, the Upton family are returning to Boscastle for the first time. 
It's been five years since they were caught in the horrifying floods, and finally the time is right to confront difficult memories. Going back to Boss Castle, I think, will be quite cathartic. Um, there is a ghost, I think, that needs to be laid, and I'm hoping that going back will do that. We've not been to Cornwall um, for five years, and I'm quite looking forward to seeing what they've done with the village, um, because my last memory is of broken roads, um, wrecked houses and shops, um, and it will be good to see it cleaned up and, and looking pretty again. <laughs> yes, all right. <laughs> I'd like to go back, just to try and put it behind me. It'll be like I can close that chapter on my life and, and live with it because every now and again I will think about it and uh, it, is, it is quite overwhelming um, ju just thinking about all, the, all that water. The car park where John narrowly avoided being swept out to sea looks very different in the sunlight. The car will have been virtually there. Um, so when obviously I, I came out, all of this all of it was just water. Um, it must have been up to up to there at the time of when I got on the car, and um, it's it's unreal. Actually, imagining that here now just seems it it it, it just seems unfeasible. You never know how something like this is going to affect you until you're actually where it happened. And um, it's a bit overwhelming, to say the least. Um, That's good. I just, yeah, sorry. The people of Boss Castle have rallied, and the village is now unrecognisable from those scenes of chaos. Pubs are full, shopkeepers busy, and visitors flock. Like any victim of the incredible flash floods that summer day, the Upton family will never forget what damage the weather can do. But for now, it's just good to see Boss Castle up and running again. It looks good now. It does look good. It's beautiful again. And the sun is shining. <laughs> it's not raining. Yeah. Yeah, much nicer. Thankfully, all these people survived Britain's extreme weather. So join us next time for more amazing true stories on Living Dangerously.